workshop like this because you feel a bit like a comedy warm-up connect. Um, so I'll try not to, to disappoint, at least on the warm-up bit. Um, I want to keep it quite general, really, because the <clears throat> we have a, the themes of the day. I want this talk to try to um, ask a bunch of questions. I'm not going to be giving you many answers, which is quite convenient because I don't know many. Um, <clears throat> really asking some questions of, of deep neural networks and their applicability, as it were, as, as approaches to understanding biological vision and at the same time hoping that we can tease apart some of the things that uh, deep network approaches need to take in, on board um, with respect to what we know about biological vision and hopefully um, we can further constrain deep network approaches uh, in machine vision to function more e efficiently knowing what we do about how the human, <clears throat> the human brain does that. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I sort of rather provocatively uh, decided to uh, call my talk something like DNN's new black box. <clears throat> really, that's just to allow us to ask, ask some questions about what we know about DNN's and how they, do, how they do what they do and how that compares to what we think we know uh, about the biological vision system. So, without going into a huge amount, I'm a biological vision person, I should, should point out, I'm not a machine vision person, but I've had a, a long-standing interest um, in deep neural networks uh, and the variants of deep neural networks for some time, and been a part of the VIM um, network, which, which Andrew um, um, helped set up, and which has been a fantastic community for bringing together biological vision and computer vision researchers over the last um, three three or four years, I forget, four years now. Um, so really a lot of what I'm talking to you about today has come about through my interactions over the years with, with, with people in the VIM network, so it's really good. So what I want to do is just provide a really brief overview of uh, DNNs and where we're at with DNNs in terms of their performance, and ask some questions um, that get to trying to figure out what we know about how DNNs accomplish what they do, but also... Um, how we should be comparing um, DNN, DNN performance to human performance, and what kinds of ranges of data should we be looking at? <clears throat> Is it sufficient for us to uh, be uh, looking at the accuracy, um, the error rates of deep neural networks, comparing those to human vision and saying, well, look, it must be the case then that uh, a DNN is performing task similarly to human vision. I think that would be... Uh, not the right way to approach this, and I'm going to try to argue that we need to be looking <clears throat> particularly at the nature's of errors, um, but also uh, asking what's so special about biological vision systems anyway. What do we know about the way that biological vision systems process sensory data um, in the visual system? What kind of computations do they do? What kind of representational structures do they do? Uh, do they uh, compute? Um, because that that knowledge, I think, provides really fundamental constraints on what machine vision systems that we might like to use to emulate aspects of human vision have to incorporate. Um, what kind of constraints of human vision do, do machine vision systems need to care about? Um, so I'm going to be sort of drawing a distinction between what you might call biologically inspired um, approaches, um, <coughs> network approaches and psychologically inspired ones because there can be a big difference between those sorts of claims. <clears throat> so, I mean, superficially, of course, um, we've there have been new deep neural networks with lots of good reasons have generated tremendous excitement in the biological vision community, partly because uh, of the idea that they seem, at least superficially, to be <clears throat> sort of more biologically plausible to plausible than some previous approaches, um, based on what we currently know about um, uh, sensory data processing in the ventral visual system, <clears throat> particularly in relation to uh, non-linear transformation, hierarchical sequential structure in terms of processing data. Um, and we know now, of course, quite a bit, and the field has progressed quite dramatically in the last uh, 20 or so years, I would say, or 25 years, in terms of our understanding of the kinds of computations that are being performed uh, in, the, in the ventral visual system. Um, 
everything from V1 up to IT. Um, so, uh, just by way of having, I'm aware of the fact that we've most likely got quite a diverse uh, audience here. Um, so, uh, starting a bit of the, the progress that's been made in DNN sort of performance, um, we can go back perhaps even earlier than this, but I chose to go back to the AlexNet, which was an eight layer convolutional neural network architecture, um, which is shown here. And um, looking here at something like 60 million or uh, three parameters, 650,000 uh, neurons uh, trained on 15 million images classify a thousand categories um, and uh, performs sort of quite dramatically better than uh, its closest benchmark at the time in the ILS um, VRC 2012. Um, top five error rate, so that's the likelihood that the correct response as it were would be in its, one of its top five outputs. That's 15.3%, which is remarkably lower than the next best uh, system in the, in the competition at that time, 26.2%. Um, and uh, you can see here just an example actually um, taken from I think the 2012 paper of the uh, kinds of stimulus inputs that were um, tested, used, used to test um, AlexNet at the time. Um, the one on the right shows uh, the, on the left hand column, it shows the, the training image uh, and there, gives you the sense of the generality, the, the ability of the network to generalize the correctly classified, visually similar, different exemplars of the same, same category. Um, <clears throat> and then moving on, just one more year, um, the um, uh, Ziegler Fergus Net. Eight, eight layer architecture again, trained this time on 1.3 million images over 12 days. Uh, top five error rate, error rate now down to 11.2%. Uh, depending on who you ask um, in relation to image classification in the human performance, which you may be wondering quite rightly, uh, you may be told that the, the estimates for human error rates in this kind of task would be something like 5 to 10%. But of course, that crucially depends on how much time is available the observer to, to classify the images and so on. Um, <clears throat> so we're getting close here to a human level of performance. And then an increase in the complexity and the depth of the, uh, of the architectures in terms of adding um, uh, new layers here. This is Google Net, um, <coughs> a 22 layer architecture, 1.3 million images. Again, 6.7% um, error rates. It's getting getting pretty good, if not better, than uh, uh, human observers might be expected to do on these sorts of tasks. Um, <clears throat> and um, if we go down, I have another one here, 152 layer <clears throat> architecture here, ResNet, this is a, uh, a Microsoft network. Um, the one on the right isn't that one actually, so VGG19 is on the left, the right hand panel. The ResNet 152 um, layer network, 4.49% top error rate, which is getting pretty extraordinary in terms of its um, accuracy, classification, ability. Um, <clears throat> now, so uh, <clears throat> DNNs, um, I'm not the person to tell you, to go into a lot of detail about the, the, um, uh, the mechanics, as it were, of DNNs. But uh, clearly, with performance like that, the, the, the biological vision system and architectures that resemble some of the higher level kind of uh, uh, understanding we have of, of hierarchical processing in the ventral visual system, um, quite remarkable claims have been made about deep network approaches as, as properties for, for biological vision systems. So here's one which I attributed to anonymous. Uh, CNNs provide the most powerful and plausible model of object recognition in human vision to date. The most plausible and powerful model, model of object recognition. Now, to me, the question really, really here is what, what is a model of human vision? The model needs to, or theory needs to explain 
what empirical um, phenomena uh, we know about the human visual system. Uh, in order to be able to um, explain, we need to be able to explain that data and predict what should happen under some other kinds of circumstances. <clears throat> so to, to argue that a convolutional neural network is the most powerful and plausible model of object recognition in human vision today is a, is a bold claim. Um, <clears throat> Say where that claim comes from, but you can look it up in, in, this, in, this, in this book. Um, so, a number of issues that we need to, to be looking at here is um, firstly, what are DNNs doing? Um, what kinds of representational structures are they computing and how are they doing it? Um, and <clears throat> what kind of performance should we be uh, comparing? Um, DNNs too, in terms of human level data. So there, are, there are again, just to illustrate a number of approaches that have been taken in recent years to try to get at the questions about what DNNs are doing and how they're doing what they do. Um, and to some extent, these mirror approaches that have been taken to understand um, the nature of um, stimulus representation or representational structures uh, in different. Um, parts of the ventral visual system <clears throat> from things like functional imaging data. But in general, what you can see, or what the claim, so this is, a, uh, this is the Ziegler and Fergus approach, deconvolution approach, and you can see here um, the kind of image structure, well, if I do that, you guys won't be able to see, but um, <clears throat> you can see here uh, different layers um, of the five uh, layer <clears throat> network the kind of feature structures that are maximally activated by particular types of stimuli. Um, so as you might expect at very early levels of, of, of a network, the stimulus features are elementary kind of edge units, blobs and so on, things that might look a bit like cabals. Um, and as you get higher up into the system, the representations become more... Um, um, uh, similar, I suppose, to the to the input structure in terms of what's um, meant to be captured and labelled. Um, so, arguably, um, the representations uh, that are being computed um, <clears throat> are compositional in some sense because they are uh, the combination of different sort of feature structures at earlier levels in the system, and that is not unlike what we think the human visual system does because. Of, early visual uh, areas like V1 <clears throat> will be giving us information about sort of edge structure in the image um, <clears throat> and IT is, is going to be representing something that we know about objects, object properties of the world. So <clears throat> there's this kind of complex hierarchical complexity in a, in a sort of feed forward network like that. <clears throat> so <clears throat> All that's very well and good. Performance is, is really extraordinary, and in some cases better than human performance, which is I would say <coughs> potentially problematic as well. <clears throat> but why? Why? What is so important about biological vision systems? And <clears throat> here I'm really talking about the human visual system. So we know that the, the human visual system is very robust. Uh, it's robust to things like scene clutter, changes in lighting, collusion, viewpoint, etc. I mean, we have this remarkable. Uh, visual system that has evolved over 50 odd million years that allows us to do stuff that we rarely think about. <clears throat> um, and we have to assume, I suppose, that uh, given the, the processing um, structure that we have in terms of you know, neurons and so on, that the system is, 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 um, has adapted over time um, and is in some sense a kind of evolutionary optimization of, of, of a visual system. Um, <clears throat> crucially also the biological visual system is adaptive so um, we can um, process sensory information to do a whole bunch of different things not just classify images but we can reach out and pick up this cup of coffee and so on um, <clears throat> and we might suppose that in order to do that we have a uh, quite abstract and flexible representational structure that, um, that uh, for computing object shape that allows us to potentially differentially weight specific sorts of features that we might be able to extract from the input in order to optimize performance on a different kind of task. So, <clears throat> for example, 
whatever that representational structure is, it's probably going to tell us ultimately something about surface properties of objects, because if you want to reach out and grasp something, we don't reach out and grasp um, <coughs> edges. And we need to know <coughs> about the, the textural properties um, of the objects as well. Um, <coughs> so our representations must be uh, adaptive. They must be um, quite abstract, because we can generalize uh, our recognition quite successfully. We can recognize very minimalistic kinds of visual images, pipe figures and so on, classify those at relative ease. Um, <clears throat> so whatever representational structure we have is sufficiently adapted to allow us to generalize with a great degree of flexibility. Um, the, it, is, it is necessarily also, uh, I would argue, compositional in the sense that uh, our visual system and numerous studies have shown this and provided evidence to support this kind of claim that the human visual system is compositional. In other words, it cares about structure and it cares about the spatial <coughs> properties of that structure and how parts um, interrelate to each other, however you might define those parts to be. <coughs> There's also plenty of evidence as well that the human visual system is not purely a feed-forward system, at least I would argue that. There's plenty of evidence that the human visual system is entirely feed-forward. There's lots of recurrent processing um, um, that goes on in the human visual system. And as I hope to be able to show you in a second, there's evidence too that architecture matters, processing architecture matters. So um, we appear to be able to, to some extent, parallel process visual properties of objects um, at a different spatial scale. <coughs> and I'll present some data to show you that's the case. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually a neuropsychologist by background, so a lot of the, a lot of the work that I've done in the past is with populations of individuals who have sustained some form of brain injury, uh, a stroke or a degenerative illness, that affects the visual system. And one of the remarkable things about that is that when the brain is damaged, when the visual system is damaged, um, it doesn't just fall apart in a kind of random way, it falls apart in a structured way. And the kinds of acquired uh, cognitive impairments that you see are uh, very indicative of the structure of the normal system with some damaged components. So patients who have visual agnosias, which are acquired disorders of visual object recognition, will make certain kinds of errors depending on the variety, as it were, of object uh, agnosia that they have. Um, and those errors are non-random, they're quite systematic, and arguably they reflect properties of the rich structure of the human visual system. <clears throat> and we need to be paying attention to the nature of those kinds of errors. What do uh, deep networks do when they're damaged? What kind of errors do they? If we're making claims from DNNs to models of human uh, object recognition, we need to um, verify, in fact, that the networks break down in ways that are um, uh, consistent with what we know about human performance. Uh, the other thing is that the human visual system uh, is, is, is fallible. So um, uh, I know we have a talk, I think. Uh, I didn't realize this at the time, but there's a talk coming up uh, later, I think, in, in the session today about visual illusion. And I think these are absolutely fascinating. I'm really looking forward to listening to that talk. Um, the human visual system is very susceptible to certain kinds of visual illusions. And we can't switch them off. So uh, no matter how many times um, you, uh, somebody explains to you what the, what the stimulus actually is, it's very difficult for you to, uh, on many occasions, to uh, become less susceptible to the illusion. Why illusions are so fascinating to me, at least, is that they seem to indicate some kind of um, properties of the architecture of the human visual system. That, in other words, we can only process things in certain ways, no matter how hard we try. I would argue that much of that structure, or some of that structure, comes from our genetic inheritance. We're born with it. We just cannot switch off. Um, but um, I don't wish to <coughs> focus on, on the illusions right now. What I wanted to focus on, just as a, as a case in point, is, is one thing about biological vision that uh, machine vision systems, deep networks, really need to get to grips with, is geometry. So, and again, I think there's a talk coming up about geometry, which I didn't know about either. Um, but um, the human visual system absolutely cares about shape. Shape is crucial to our ability to, to uh, recognize objects, classify scenes as an interactive world. And <clears throat> despite the fact that you've never seen this object before, of course, you have absolutely, I would hope, no difficulty in um, 
perceiving what the three-dimensional structure of this shape would be. Um, <coughs> <laughs> Lots of empirical work over the years has shown that we are able to, and the human visual system is sensitive to different kinds of um, properties of object shapes over different um, spatial scales, and we can kind of broadly distinguish, and it's a long-standing distinction, although somewhat misleading, I think, between sort of local, <clears throat> the local image structure. Um, so uh, local image structure is stuff that you can kind of extract locally from a particular patch on an image edges, bits of surface curvature. Global image features are more to do with uh, part structure of objects, symmetry, um, the 3D configuration and so on. And uh, yeah, so the ideas around global and local processing are quite long standing in studies of human vision. You're probably familiar with this kind of claim about global to local course to find um, sort of processing that, uh, that we think the human visual system really cares about both global and local image structure and that it can to, to some extent compute the structure of these scales in, in parallel. <clears throat> Interestingly I, I said that uh, it's really important I think to look at what happens when the brain is damaged. These are some um, data uh, from patients who have either right uh, stroke, right-sided strokes or left-sided strokes. Uh, you can see this is a copying task. Uh, you can see that uh, the right-sided uh, CVAs, uh, cerebrovascular accidents, <coughs> patients will be able to um, um, faithfully replicate local shape structures so they can compute the or represent, reproduce the, the local image features of these stimuli but not the global structure. Um, as you can see in these two examples, and in contrast, this isn't always the case, but um, left-sided lesions are <clears throat> often associated with the inability actually to, or difficulty in perceiving local image structure, but not global image structure, as you can see, <clears throat> as you can see here. The idea here is, is that the right cerebral hemisphere has something special to do with computing global from object structure in the left cerebral hemisphere, local object structure. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we've done a, a range of experiments <coughs> as well to kind of explore this um, in um, ERP studies and other things by generating um, 3D object sets like these where we systematically <clears throat> manipulate the similarity of the, the stimulus objects in terms of their global 3D global structure and their 2D outline. So for any target object here, for example, there is uh, an image variant, a distractor if you like, that has uh, the same three-dimensional part structure but in a different 3D configuration or uh, a station 3D configuration comprised of different parts or a distractor that shares neither local parts or global structure, if you like. And we're interested to see what effects um, this has, this manipulation has on human performance. Uh, oh, so there's a slide illustrating that. So uh, if you imagine the, the stimulus on the left there is, is as it were, the, base, the baseline object. Um, and these, <clears throat> this version of the stimulus here has similar parts, but a different configuration. So it has the same kind of 3D model parts, um, but a different configuration. <clears throat> this one here has different parts, but the same configuration, so the 3D configuration is the same. And this stimulus shares neither the local structure or the global, um, global structure. <clears throat> and in a, if you measure just response times in a sort of image discrimination task, you know, there's a time cost um, that you consistently <coughs> observe. People find it harder to discriminate what objects that share global configuration and obviously you decouple the image um, uh, the, the pixel locations of the image features by changing the scale of the objects or putting them on different parts of the screen or doing any number of things uh, even rotating them um, and you find that there's a time cost here involved in discriminating objects that share their 3D um, uh, configuration 
So one of the things I would be interested to see is whether a, a, a DNN that's been trained to classify these images would similarly show some kind of interference from global image structure. Um, because that, to me, suggests that uh, there's something uh, interesting about the way the human brain processes, differentially processes local and global shape. These are data from ERP, which I wouldn't, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with ERP. Uh, it's a measure of left to potentials on the scalp, but it's one reason why it's a very interesting technique for us to use biological vision is that it provides very high temporal resolution. So it allows us to ask questions about when things are happening um, during visual processing, uh, not so much where things are happening, but certainly when things are happening in the brain. And <clears throat> these are just the... Um, Electrical potentials in a relatively early um, component of visual processing called the N1, the first negative uh, component after stimulus onset, which is highlighted in this box. And the only thing really that I want you to focus on here is that you get differential sensitivity to uh, as early as 170 odd milliseconds after stimulus onset to um, images that either share global structure but not local structure or local structure but not global structure. In other words, there's this very early and real sensitivity during visual processing to this, uh, the, the shape properties of objects at different spatial scales. Um, <clears throat> so there's some recent work which uh, I thought was really impressive from Philip Kalman's lab, actually, and I was looking at this paper and I wanted to include it. And they, they were basically asking this very question that, uh, that I've been interested in. Um, and their question was whether, whether they can get a deep neural, uh, deep convolutional network to <coughs> show sensitivity to global shape in a way that we think humans might do. And the way they did that was by training, uh, I think it's the VGG19 layer network that they actually uh, use. Um, yeah, <coughs> which is the one on the left here. So it's a 19 layer network. Um, but they basically train the network with stimulus sets where they systematically manipulated the global shape and the textural elements of the object. So they combined, for example, <coughs> the global shape of a common object, the one on the far left there being, top far left being, I think, a teapot, and it's got a golf ball. Uh, global texture, and they did this for lots of different kinds of animals, animals as well. So this is, a, I think, a camel with a zebra's um, um, texture, um, and they used, they they did this manipulation to see how uh, sensitive the, um, the the network, when tested, would be <coughs> to perturbations of global and local shape. And you can see here actually that uh, so the, this shows just some examples of that, the outputs when things don't go entirely correctly. Um, in the left-hand column here <coughs> is the, um, the object shape, so the global shape of the object, and in, in, in the second column across oops, is the, um, the texture that's been used. And here are the top five choices, and they're able to show that most of the time when the network makes a mistake, it bases its decision on the local texture and not the global shape. With some exceptions, so for example, the teapot golf ball um, <clears throat> is classified as golf ball, not teapot. So in other words, the, the local properties are taking priority and they present lots of interesting examples of when this happens. It doesn't always happen, so the trombone is, is actually the top choice, the obelisk is third choice in this case. But their, their point is that the although the classification accuracy is extremely high, for the, uh, uh, the VGG19 network that they use. Um, it seems to be blind to global shape. In other words, it's not extracting shape, really, at all. Um, uh, there are some other interesting experiments here. <coughs> so, um, sorry, I have a touch screen, and it's supposed to be very sensitive. Um, the network trained to recognize this grand piano was unable to correctly classify any of these variants of the grand piano um, which, of course, we don't have any problem doing. We can see that all of those are grand pianos, but they've um, um, confounded global shape with unusual local textures to confuse the network very easily. Um, <clears throat> this is an interesting manipulation where they disrupt the um, global shape properties of the stimuli, <coughs> so they successfully train the network and then see if it can correctly classify these stimuli, even though the global shape has been 
perturbed, and the network is very successful in doing that um, in ways that human observers wouldn't be. It would take us some of these are really hard, if not impossible, <coughs> for us to be able to correctly classify. And yet the network is doing very well. In other words, it's basing its, its classification judgments on, on local image structure. Um, <coughs> And here they do the kind of converse where they've trained the network on a bunch of silhouettes and then perturbed, in only very, very minor ways, perturbed the local image structure. And um, this doesn't create any problem for, for human observers. We can easily say, well, it's a, a camel, a hammer, get to a microphone. Um, and what they're showing here is the fact that... Um, um, the ability of the image, uh, ability of the network to classify the images is, as I said before, um, dramatically affected by local perturbations in structure. So that's the very low performance here, which is equivalent to this condition, but not by perturbations of global structure. So really the, the sort of take-home point of, of this work, which is really, really nice work actually, and I recommend everyone have a look at it, is that the network blinds global structure in ways that humans aren't. Um, we were interested in these stimuli, these impossible object stimuli in a project that I've been working on with Dietmar Heinke and Alice Leonardis at the University of Birmingham. And uh, one of the reasons I'm interested in these objects is that potentially they give us a way to, um, to ask questions about the point at which um, local and global image structure come together in the human visual system. So hopefully uh, you can quite easily distinguish between um, the geometrically possible objects on the top row and the geometrically uh, impossible objects in the bottom row, which couldn't exist in 3D space because they have inconsistent um, uh, surface connectivity. Um, so, for example, here. <clears throat> and why they're potentially interesting, I think, is that the, the only the, the point in time at which you're able to tell that one of those stimuli is, is impossible has to be when you're attempting to integrate what you know about the likely hypothesized global structure of the object <coughs> and the local image features. Now, I won't go into the details of the work that we've been doing. I, do, I did put it in the slide, couldn't resist it. I just, uh, uh, look, you know, it's not really important for today, just to say that the human visual system detects these. Uh, things much, much um, uh, more quickly than you would suspect from response times, which, which can be in the order of seconds. Within about 300 milliseconds of stimulus onset, you're seeing early differential visual sensitivity to object possibility, um, which I think is interesting. So this is the work that we've done on, on um, modeling. We um, <clears throat> trained, um, I think, a 16-layer uh, network. This is actually work that was done by one of Deep Mars master students, Matthew Yates, who I'd just like to acknowledge um, here. Um, and we wanted to see whether or not uh, the network was able to then, when tested, distinguish between impossible and possible <laughs> objects. And of course, as you can see here, it's absolutely hopeless. Um, <clears throat> so the one to focus on is the VGG 16 layer network here. So it reaches sort of criterion uh, relatively quickly when it's trained and told what's what. But when we test um, the network, it barely performs, you know, above chance. Human observers will be highly accurate um, in doing this. Um, it will be not necessarily super fast, although, as I said, the visual system is picking up sensitivity very early. We were, so far, we have been able to get a network that can um, reach criterion in training uh, when tested to distinguish reliably between possible and impossible objects. Uh, why is that important? Well, I think it's important because it seems to me to tell us that the network is not doing um, uh, image classification in the way that the human brain is doing image classification. <clears throat> so, just to conclude, um, <coughs> provide the most powerful and plausible model of object recognition in the human state. If that were true, I think we'd be in big trouble. Okay. Um, um, because we have to ignore huge swaths of, of, of data from what we know 
from years of psychophysical experiments um, in visual perception. Um, some of the important questions that uh, we, we need to ask, and just a few, um, is how, how do we know, how would we know actually when uh, a DNN is incorporating some theory of, of biological vision? And, and I think to answer that, we have to, as I've said, um, yes, it has to be biologically plausible at some level if that's what we want to do, <clears throat> but it has to respect and be able to. Um, and that allows us to explain the, the psychological phenomena of, of human vision. Um, and I've tried to argue that they're, currently, they're not currently there yet. We may get there, but we're not currently there yet. And this actually also, um, an important part, part of this is architecture. <clears throat> I think uh, the computational systems that we develop need to speak to um, what we think we know about parallel processing of object structure across different spatial scales. Uh, which, at least on my understanding, um, uh, DNMs currently don't do. And they also need to um, um, be shown to be computing uh, image structure in ways that respect what we think we know about the way the human visual system represents object structure. Um, another important thing is evaluation of claims about DNMs in relation to um, human vision, biological vision, is that, and that is... How can we distinguish between theoretically relevant and um, theoretically irrelevant properties of DNA? What are the key drivers of all the parameters that we played around with? What are the key drivers of relevance to um, our particular theory of, of human vision? And how would we know what they are? In other words, what aspects of DNA, uh, the assumptions that go into any particular um, deep network, and the number of layers, the number of units, the, 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 the learning parameters, and so on. Which ones of those are relevant to testing a particular theory? Um, and how confident would we be that any particular DNA instantiates a particular theory of, of human vision? How would we know, actually, that the DNA is, a, is a, uh, a faithful implementation of a particular psychological theory? Um, <clears throat> And finally, I would just underline the fact that it's not entirely clear yet, I don't think, although um, I'm pretty sure some, some of the folks here in the room will have some strong views about this. Um, it's not entirely clear yet what kinds of data we should be evaluating deep networks against, what kinds of human data, the biological vision data we should be evaluating DNNs against. In terms of trying to figure out whether they are making contributions to theory development in the biological domain. Um, I haven't gone into it here, but, um, but of course, as I said before, <coughs> it clearly cannot be solely about performance accuracy, just because a network performs as well as, if not even better, shot higher than human performance. That doesn't mean it's doing the task in the same way. Um, what really counts, actually, is the errors. The errors and the kinds of errors that are made. Do those, does a network make errors that can be uh, meaningfully compared to human performance? Not only in the neurologically normal brain, but uh, equally in the neurologically impaired brain. <clears throat> uh, thanks to some of the folks that have worked on this stuff over the years, um, particularly more recently, Dietmar and Alish, uh, at, um, in Birmingham. Um, <clears throat> and before, last thing I want to say is I just wanted to draw attention, and Andrew will permit me to, to a special issue uh, in vision research, which is uh, uh, which we're trying to put together. I really hope that um, some of the contributors today would consider submitting papers to, um, to this. So, uh, what do biological or deep uh, neural networks tell us about biological vision? And, the kinds of papers that we're really, really interested in in considering are those that sort of ask these challenging questions about the appropriateness of, of um, deep, uh, deep networks in, in terms of trying to understand you know, biological vision systems and asking some of these tough questions. Um, so, sorry for the excuse for the plug. So, there we go. Thank you.